Act Two of The Princess and the Butterfly or The Fantastics by Arthur Wayne Pinheiro. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Second Act The scene represents the smoking room and the billiard room of a West End London mansion. The stage is mainly occupied by the smoking room. The billiard room is seen through a wide arch on the left. The fireplace, where a bright fire is burning, is on the right. Beyond the fireplace, in the right-hand corner of the smoking room, about eight feet above the floor level, is a door reached by a broad flight of steps with a handsome balustrade stretching out into the room. This is the principal entrance to the rooms. In the center wall, but on the floor level, there is another door. Running obliquely on the left side is the arch, supported by pilasters, admitting to the billiard room, which is reached by two or three steps. At the upper end of this room, which is well in sight of the spectator, are the marking boards, cue racks, and general fitments of a billiard room and a lounge seat. The billiard table itself is also partly seen. In the smoking room are settees, small tables, chairs, and a circular ottoman. At the extreme back, against the wall, is a larger table upon which stands a silver tray with decanters of spirits, glasses of all sizes, and bottles and siphons of aerated waters. Round the fireplace is a fender seat. Statuettes bearing electric branches are disposed about the rooms. It is night time, and the rooms are brilliantly lighted. Sir James Villaray, a dried, careworn man of about fifty, in levy dress, is standing in the center of the room, shaking hands with Sir George Lamoron. On his right is Ronald St. Roche, a little, simple-looking, florid man with a wrinkled brow large staring eyes and an air of suppressed anxiety seated upon the settee are colonel arthur eve and the honorable charles denstroud eve is forty-eight in appearance a typical soldier denstroud is a handsome young man with a finely chiseled but expressionless face and of a generally calm exterior bartley levan and percival ord also modish young men the latter especially foolish looking are to be seen moving about the billiard table playing billiards another young man adrian mills is leaning against the pilaster pretending to watch the game but really posing in manner and dress he attempts to recall the graces particular to the period of the regency he wears a stock a fob chain a high coat collar is wasp-waisted, and his trousers, which are broad across the hips, taper finely to his ankles. Some of the men are smoking. A servant is in the billiard room, marking the game, and the click of the balls is heard. Sir James, turning to St. Roche. I am sorry I must run away. My wife will be back from the theatre soon. Ah, uh, I should like to have shaken hands with Mrs. St. Roche. St. Roche, ascending the steps with Sir James. I wish the speaker and his levy at the deuce, my dear Sir James. I do, really. They go out. A peculiarly stupid, vacant laugh is heard from Ord. Sir George winces and puts his fingers in his ears. Denstrad goes into the billiard room. Eve, joining Sir George. Percival's laugh gets upon your nerves. My dear Arthur, what possessed Ronald to bid these buzzing midges to their ceremony of saying goodbye to the broken butterfly? Why should your final impressions be entirely of drowsy insects like myself? Mills bestirs himself and takes snuff elegantly. Sir George, eyeing Mills, drawing Eve aside. Now tell me, you who are, comparatively, of sound mind and body, does our friend Adrian there, for instance, 
cheer you? Eve, smiling. Hmm, rather amuses me, I own. Upon whom, or on what, is he modeling himself now, in heaven's name? Last summer he was Napoleonic, and had a curl on his forehead, and was full of strategy. He has been babbling incessantly of the Prince Regent, and of Brumel, for the past few weeks. Ah, that explains his appearance to-night. Napoleon, I remember. He is very inconstant. St. Roche returns and descends the steps. There is another laugh from Ord. <laughs> Percival's in fine form. He goes into the billiard room. Mills accompanies Eve, putting an arm upon his shoulder. St. Roche to Sir George. Veneret looks a bad colour, don't he? His hue is somewhat pre-Raphaelite. What's his age? Fifty-something? Uh, no, no, my age. Nine and forty. Forty-nine or fifty-nine. What does it matter after you're forty? <laughs> of course, Jimmy's a bad colour. I'm a bad colour. You're a bad colour. <laughs> We're all a bad colour. Ord laughs again. Sir George writhes. <sighs> St. Roche poking the fire. My dear chap, you must forgive me, but you're wrong. Putting a log on. You're wrong. In fact, there's no doubt about it. You, you, you are damn out of sorts. Oh, that's true. Just as some men get angry and see blood, you're walking about seeing wrinkles. Now, my dad was a parson, a leading light of the Church of England. What's that to do with it, Ronnie? Oh, nothing. Except in the, I suppose, preaching runs a bit in our family. At any rate, I feel bound to tell you, George, it's my deliberate opinion. You, 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 you're behaving wicked. Sir George, sitting on the ottoman, facing St. Roche humbly. I perceive a sermon, O oh son of a gun, Canon. Canon St. Roche, your late father. A little joke, Ronnie, and in the worst possible taste. Ah, uh, I wish you made more jokes of that sort nowadays, dear fella. However, sermon or no sermon, you're going away, and leaving your native country, and hiding, and all that. It's, it, I must say it, my dear dad would have said it. It's damn feeble. Oh, of course it is. But what's the remedy? St. Roche rubbing his brow anxiously and wearily. Against feeling stale and, and bothered and generally finished. Uh, against feeling stale and bothered and generally finished. I'll tell you, George. It's a thousand pities you haven't come to me for advice before. A servant, carrying a small box, enters and descends the steps, going towards the billiard room. What's that? Mr. Levon's toy, sir, just arrived. His servant had took him to the wrong house. The servant goes into the billiard room. Toys? Certainly. Bartley's got quite a craze for toys just now has all the novelties from Paris and Vienna, and people like him to bring his toys to their houses. Do they? Oh, yes. Just now, people are wanting to see Bartley's toys. I like him to bring them to my house. Do you? Ord in the billiard room. Oh, look here. Bartley's toys have turned up. <laughs> oh. Yes, and people are asking Percival out a great deal just now. 
are they because barclay's toys make percival laugh just now people are wanting to hear percival laugh i want to hear percival laugh the servant crosses the room again and goes out bored in the billiard room oh i say do look ho <laughs> sir george hiding his face against the drum of the ottoman in half serious half assumed despair oh st roche laying a hand on sir george's shoulder and now you know my method of getting through life george now you know what my what do you call it my my panacea for all the ills that flesh is heir to if you have to grow old yourself don't live with people who continually remind you that your clock's running down as a matter of fact it's my wife's notion as much as my own we take precious good care to always have a lot of youngsters about us men half my age we live in an atmosphere of youth gaiety high spirits my dear ronnie you don't believe i could bring myself to see any gaiety in this sort of racket do you you used to find heaps of fun in it did i did you i suppose i did there is a yell of delight from ord sir george starts to his feet joining in the laugh mirthlessly <laughs> ah whoop good first class sir george relapsing into gloom youth gaiety high spirits well there is something in your idea lolling against the drum of the ottoman ronnie i often think that if when i was a poor devil in the colonial office i had had the pluck to marry on a beggarly income to marry some meek unpretending girl and could in these days have been amusing myself over sending a boy to harrow and then watching a little romp of a daughter oh no dear fella dash it all nothing of that sort eh st roch perspiringly not marriage dear fella whatever you do Whew well you're a nice married man oh i don't mean to say that i'm not happily married my dear boy only i'm one of the lucky ones marriage is a real good thing when it comes off don't you know but sir george carelessly oh for me the time's gone by now you keep of that mind george as i say i i'm one of the lucky ones but i uh, i'm an exception dear fella the men come out from the billiard room bartley levan with his box of toys percival ord following him gleefully levan deposits the box on a table and standing behind it displays the toys ord sits on the settee Mills, always attitudinizing and self-absorbed, arranges himself on the arm of the settee. Denstroud and Eve stand right and left of Levan. Anything new, Bartley? I took two extraordinary German talking dolls to Tollington House last night. I was there. Oh, those dolls make me laugh so. Where are they? lady grace kept them oh confound levan has now distributed some of his toys hideous spiders clockwork rats and various mechanical beasts and birds the men with the exception of sir george who looks on with staring eyes and open mouth examine and work the toys and are highly entertained there is much talking and laughter ord rolls on the settee in ecstasy St. Roche, disappointed over an egg which should produce a chicken but fails to do so, 
Yeah, I say. Mine's broken. Give me another. He drags some other toys and a velvet embroidered fool's cap out of the box. The fool's cap drops from his hand, falling at Sir George's feet. What have you found? St. Roche placing upon the floor in front of the table a swan drawing a dog cart. First class, look at this. The men bend forward eagerly to watch the swan applauding its progress. Suddenly, Sir George discovers the fool's cap, snatches it up, and puts it upon his head. Ha 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 The men turn to him in surprise. Eh, hey, what? Sir George hops around the ottoman grotesquely. The men laugh. That's right, dear fella. That's how we like to see you. Sir George, partly in earnestness, partly in a spirit of mockery. My good friends, I have become conscious that I am a shocking wet blanket tonight. I have made a poor return to old Ronnie here. To, to all of you for this farewell pat on the back you so kindly administer. But you know, Ronnie knows. I've been in the blues lately, and in the doctor's hands. Taking a small file from his waistcoat pocket. Look here, a dose of digestive medicine. I ought to have taken it immediately after dinner. Producing a pill box from another pocket. A pill to be swallowed at bedtime. It is past my prescribed bedtime now flinging both file and pill-box into the grate. To the devil with them! Ronnie has imparted to me the true, the sovereign cure for all the ills and sours of life. It is to cultivate the tastes and to view the world with the eyes of you light-hearted boys. Jumping on to the ottoman and seating himself upon the drum. I am with you, king of you, I call myself to the throne. Miles, don't look so portentous and solemn. You will depress me. Levan, more toys. I command your laugh again, Percival. Then Stroud, you monopolize a most precious monkey upon a stick. Then Stroud hands him the toy. <laughs> we thank you. They all laugh, humoring him. Eve stands by the fire. Out with your treasures, Levan. Sorry, the box is empty. Empty? Empty? Yes. Taking out a collapsed air ball painted to resemble a human face with a mouthpiece attached to it. With the exception of this. What's that? Levan, trying with only partial success to blow out the air ball. You have to inflate it and it becomes a face as you see, and then you allow the air to escape, and the face wrinkles and shrivels up. Wrinkles and shrivels up? Levan, blowing. Confound the thing. And then it gives a despairing screech and collapses, expires. Or mournfully. Some bee stuck a toothpick in it last night. It won't go, Bartley. Awfully sorry. My favorite toy. Throwing the toy back into the box. It's a dead un. A dead un. Ah, <sighs> already my reign is shadowed by evil. Taking off the fool's cap and descending from his throne. Ronnie, I abdicate. No, 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 no. no, no. no. I recognize a portent. The box is empty, except for the exceedingly uncomfortable emblem with which our friend has just entertained us. Resigning the cap and the monkey to Denstroud. Charlie, you rule in my stead. Laying a hand upon his shoulder. But even you may read a warning in the wrinkled features of Bartley Levan's favorite toy upon whom will all the susceptible women in London fix their affections? And how will you amuse yourself, eh? <laughs>
when that smooth, inscrutable face of yours begins to wrinkle and shrivel up. <laughs> Levan, the spirit of prophecy is upon me. Beware the gout. There may come a time when, still carrying your box of playthings, you limp from house to house with feet encased in felt boots. Oh! And when your merry laugh, Percival, is checked by a rasping, irritating cough. Shut up, George. Oh. oh. Sir George, turning to the fireplace. Rescue my pill from the ashes, Arthur. It is indispensable, I fear. Eve and Sir George have a playful struggle at the fireplace. Ord referring to his watch. I say, Bartley. It's half past eleven. Don't hurry away. My wife will be home in a minute. Sorry, Ronnie. I've promised to go on to the Robbies. Ord, rising. So have I. The group breaks up. Den Stroud and Mills are together. St. Roch assists Levan to replace the toys in the box, and then calls the servant from the billiard room, who takes the box and carries it off. While this is going on, Ord crosses to Sir George and talks to him. I say, La Maman, upon my word, you know I'm honestly sorry you're leaving us. Ah, my dear Percival. What I want to say to you is this, you know. Awkwardly, with some feeling. I wish you'd always keep me posted in your movements. I will because i should like to send you pick me up every week you might find a difficulty in getting it in africa or any of those places sir george taking his arm thanks it's a dreadfully amusing paper never fails to make me almost yell they go up to den stroud and mills and are joined by levan Eve comes forward. St. Roche, meeting him. You're not off, too. Eve, referring to his watch. My dear Ronnie. Dash the time. It bores my wife so to come home and find me alone. What I mean is... Mrs. St. Roche will be fatigued. Never fatigued, I assure you, when friends are here. D don't go, Arthur. I won't. First class. St. Roche joins Levan and Ord, who have said farewell to Sir George. The three ascend the steps. Eve crosses the room, wearing a thoughtful look. St. Roche, on the steps. You'll wait to see my wife, George. And Miss Zuliani? With pleasure, if I may. Good. To Denstroud. You'll stop and see my wife, Charlie. Delighted. First class. To Mills. Don't go, Adrian. Mills, laboriously extracting his watch from his fob. I fear I must take my leave, dear friend. Oh, no! Confound! St. Roche disappears, going after Levan and Ord. Denstroud strolls into the billiard room and knocks the balls about. Mills comes to Sir George. I wish you an unendurable exile, dear friend. You apprehend the compliment? Thanks, my dear Miles. We have been jesting here tonight. Yet it struck me there was, at some moments, a strain of significance in our mirth. So it struck me. And you seriously seek, dear jaded friend, a means of retaining the savor of life? Sir George, smiling. You have the air of a discoverer. Dear Lamorant, believe me, you moderns lose your relish of things because of the extreme pettiness of your vices. Really? You would suggest? 
a return to the coarse, robust, elementary viciousness of our progenitors. Mm, not of too remote a period. No. Passing his hand through his hair. I would go no further back than a particular period of the Georgian era. The time of the Prince Regent, say? And of Rumel. <laughs> <laughs> Rail on, gentlemen. Ascending the steps, gaily. Rail on. But though I live to be ninety, I shall live. Come, Come back, back Miles. Miles. Not I. I have a meeting to attend at a public house near Shaftesbury Avenue. A few of us are attempting to organize a cockfight in the cellar. He goes out. Sir George, at the foot of the steps... <laughs> oh, what is to be the next remedy? <laughs> but it is a quaint notion, George. Dressing up to restore obsolete vices. He strolls away, joining Dan Stroud in the billiard room. Sir George at a table, filling a tumbler from a siphon. As if vice ever alters, it is only in virtue that there are changes of fashion. Fay Zuliani appears at the top of the steps, a bewitching creature with a foreign air and foreign grace, and with an accent suggestive of many languages. She is in a theater cloak and hood, and carries a large bouquet. Her attitude towards Sir George is one of childlike reliance and confidence qualified by a strain of willfulness. He, on his side, is partly amused and partly embarrassed by the semi-paternal character he is called upon to play. Fay, seeing Sir George, gladly, Ah! She trips down the steps and joins him. He glances toward the billiard room, putting a finger to his lips. Good evening. Did you think we would never return? Sir George, smiling at her. Enjoyed yourself? Abastanza bene. With a little shrug of the shoulders. Pretty well, you know. Drawing back a step or two to display herself. I look very presentable in your opinion. Say something. Oh, charming, my dear. Thank you. I think it extremely kind of you to wait here so late to see me, eh? And Mrs. St. Roche. What a fine bouquet you are carrying. Mr. Denstrow sent it to me. Sir George, frowning. Mr. Denstrowd? Looking toward the billiard room again. He is there. Fay, passing Sir George. I will go and thank him prettily, to save myself the beastly fag of writing a letter. Not beastly fag, Fay. Where did you pick that up? At school, Miss Gordon's, while I was finishing. Hardly ladylike, eh? Not in the least ladylike. Fay making a grimace. You were too disagreeable tonight. She runs into the billiard room and joins Denstroud and Eve. Mrs. St. Roche, who also carries a bouquet, enters and comes down the steps, followed by the Princess Pannonia, Mrs. Sabiston, Mrs. Ware, Maxime de Maulier, and St. Roche. Mrs. Ware is a curiously striking, fair woman of problematical age, with regular features, large, lustrous eyes, and luxuriant golden hair rolled back from a broad white brow. She is dressed in virginal white. De Maulier is a gallant-looking, handsome young Frenchman, of about nine and twenty, speaking English glibly, but with a slight accent. The ladies are beautifully dressed and are wearing their theater cloaks. Mrs. St. Roche shaking hands with Sir George. So pleased to find you here. I have begged the Princess and Miss Sabiston to come in for a few moments. To the Princess. You have seen each other today already. Princess smiling at Sir George. Yes. The princess moves away and talks to Fay, 
Eve and Denstroud, who appear on the steps leading from the billiard room. Faye and Eve assist the princess to remove her cloak. Mrs. Saviston, advancing to Sir George. How do you do? There were five acts to the play, and we are dying of thirst. At least I am. Why is thirst so disreputable? But I have ordered some sandwiches for the sake of appearances. Sandwiches? Ah, yes. To me, the drama is famishing work. Mrs. Saviston joins the other group. She takes off her cloak, and it is placed upon a chair. Mrs. St. Roche, turning to Mrs. Ware and de Maillet, who have by this time come forward. Mr. de Maillet was at the theatre, too. To Sir George. Oh, do you know my friend, Mr. de Maillet? And Mrs. Uh, Mrs. To Mrs. Ware. Do forgive me how stupid I am. Mrs. Ware. Mrs. St. Roche to Sir George. Mrs. Ware. Sir George looks at Mrs. Ware in blank amazement. Gradually, a frown gathers upon his face. Mrs. St. Roche to Mrs. Ware and de Maunier. Sir George Lamarant. The introduction is formally acknowledged on both sides. Then de Maunier and Mrs. Ware talk to St. Roche. Mrs. St. Roche turns from Sir George and encounters Eve, who is encumbered with the princess's cloak. Sir George moves behind the settee. Mrs. St. Roche shaking hands with Eve. How do you do, Colonel Eve? How do you do? I must deposit my most precious burden somewhere. May I take your cloak? <laughs> no, thanks. She turns to Mrs. Ware. Eve places the princess's cloak over the back of the settee. Sir George to Eve quickly. Arthur, Arthur, look at that woman. Woman? Talking to Mrs. St. Roche. Eve, seeing Mrs. Ware. Powers, how does she get here? She is of the stained glass window pattern tonight. Ronald doesn't recognize her, evidently. Poor Mrs. St. Roche. Sir George, seizing Eve's arm. My dear Arthur, this is simply infernal. He draws Eve aside into the billiard room. Mrs. St. Roche comes forward, unfastening her cloak at the throat. St. Roche joins her. Demolier, the princess, and Mrs. Saviston talk together at the foot of the steps. Faye joins Mrs. Ware, and they sit, side by side, chatting on the settee. Faye removes her own theater cloak. Mrs. Ware retains hers. Den Stroud stands, eyeing St. Roche and Mrs. St. Roche. Sir George and Eve are now out of sight. St. Roche to Mrs. St. Roche, his manner with her always timid and hesitating. I say, Bella. What? St. Roche offering to assist her. Shall I uh, undo that for you? Please don't fidget me. What do you want? Who's this Mrs. What's-her-name? An acquaintance of Faye's. Faye has skated with her once or twice at the rink and taken a fancy to her. Admires her. Calls her the Madonna. The rink? It's quite right. Maxime introduced her to us. Oh... They were with a party in a box opposite ours, and Faye asked me to tell Maxime to bring her round. Denstroud has sauntered towards the settee. She perceives him. They exchange looks. St. Roche, after a glance at Mrs. Ware. Yes, she does resemble a picture you pay a franc to see in a foreign church. Go and inquire after the sandwiches. Tell Bidolf a, a large quantity. A large quantity? For Edith, for Edith. He goes away meekly. She looks round the room to assure herself that the attention of others is not upon her, then moves to the settee. She and Denstroud talk together rapidly in soft, low tones. Denstroud behind the settee. How are you? Mrs. St. Roche, tossing her bouquet on the settee and taking off her cloak. As if you care. <laughs>
What is wrong? Mrs. St. Roche, throwing her cloak across the back of the settee. I hope Miss Suliani has sufficiently thanked you for the bouquet you sent her tonight. Quite. What a fool you are making of me. I? Or rather, what a fool I have made of myself. To have this pretty young thing about me. To let you meet her here frequently. To let you contrast her day by day with the woman you are becoming sick and tired of. You're not well, dear. You're doing too much. Mrs. St. Roche, tearing at her gloves. Ha! As for those paltry flowers... She tumbles the bouquet to the floor and kicks it under the settee. As for those flowers, I thought it wise to send two bouquets to your box. Wise. Prudent. You understand me perfectly well. The look of the thing. Oh, the look of the thing, by all means. But for the future, send me no flowers. That removes the necessity of making floral offerings to any girl who happens to be staying in my house. Shh. Sir George and Eve come out from the billiard room. Mrs. St. Roche to Eve. Colonel Eve, be good-natured and open soda water bottles for me. She goes to the table, followed by Eve and Denstroud. The further group is now composed of the Princess, Mrs. Sabiston, Denstroud, Eve, Mrs. St. Roche, and Desmoulins. The popping of corks is heard at intervals. Sir George stands in front of the settee, impatiently watching Fay and Mrs. Ware, who are still sitting together. He is about to advance toward them when the princess comes down to him. Princess to Sir George. I love her. This girl? Princess with a nod. I came home with Isabel in the hope of finding you here, so that I might tell you before I go to sleep, that my heart has opened to her already and taken her in. Great heavens! The way in which Rupert looks at one out of her eyes. My dear princess, I, I kiss the ground you walk upon. By the way, I am afraid I have been guilty of an inexcusable piece of diplomacy. Sitting and motioning him to be seated. What do you think I have done? Sir George, sitting on the settee, facing her. Miss Zuliani is the most fortunate young woman in the world. You are not following me. I haven't told you. I go to Paris on Sunday, perhaps sooner. Madame de Trimorel has let me her house until the end of June. Well, I announced to them all this evening in Mrs. St. Roche's box that you have promised to be my guest for a few weeks. Sir George in horror. Paris? Tombstones. Shh, shh, shh. It was really unpremeditated. The thought flashed through me and from me that it was just the plan to enable you, in a plausible way, to settle your niece with me, and to satisfy yourself of her happiness in her new surroundings, and then the pleasure of your society. Ah. So now, I leave the rest to you. <laughs> you haven't left much to me. I mean the winning of Miss Zuliani's assent to your scheme, and without hurting Isabel St. Roche. Do you know, I am quieting my conscience with the idea that, for some reason, Isabel will not be very reluctant to part with Miss Zuliani. Bella. Poor Bella is greatly attached to the child. And yet tonight, when I asked Miss Zuliani in a coldly friendly fashion to visit me in Paris, it struck me that Bella St. Roche welcomed the suggestion eagerly. Eve, carrying a tumbler of sparkling water, approaches the princess. There is a general movement at this moment. Mrs. Ware resigns her place on the settee beside Fay to Mrs. Saviston and seats herself upon the ottoman. These three ladies are waited upon by Demoliers, who brings them soda water, etc. Mrs. St. Roche sits listening with an expressionless face to Denstroud, St. Roche enters and descends the steps, followed by two men servants carrying sandwiches in silver dishes, plates, etc., which they hand round. Of the ladies, Mrs. St. Roche, Fay, and Mrs. Saviston eat, 
the rest decline. Eve, behind the table to the princess. Princess Apollinarius. Thank you. Eve, placing the tumbler on the table. With ice in it? Thanks. Only ice? She nods and smiles. Eve moves away and joins Mrs. Saviston. Faye leaves the settee and again seats herself by Mrs. Ware. Sir George, rising and standing near the princess, speaking to her in a low voice, and watching Mrs. Ware and Faye as he talks. At any rate, my dear princess, whatever Mrs. St. Roche's feelings may be in the matter, this girl shall be removed within the next few days. That I have quite resolved. Princess, looking up at him. What is it that makes you so determined? You were vague this afternoon. For a little girl, the St. Roche menage, you said. I admit that hitherto my reasons have been a little vague and undefined, even to myself. But to-night, St. Roche has cleared up a great deal that has been puzzling me in this house lately. He and his wife hold the dangerous theory that life may be made more endurable by throwing open their front door as wide as possible. With a shrug of the shoulders. To all the young gentlemen of their acquaintance. Fie! Isn't this the prejudice of middle age? Why is it so dangerous a theory? Put it into practice, and it, at least, demands a delicate process of selection, to which dear old St. Roche is evidently unequal. For instance, who is the man who has come back with you from the theatre? Mr. de Molly. Oh, de Molly is a secretary at the French embassy here, I believe. I am inclined to like him. Nevertheless, I suspect he ought to be kicked, Princess. George! Am I right in assuming that he has presented this Mrs. Ware to you? Yes. What about her? He shrugs his shoulders again. She looks out of the corners of her eyes at Mrs. Ware, and then steadily at Sir George. What do you mean? It makes my blood boil to see Faye thrown into the society of a woman of that class. Princess, after a brief pause, rising, her tone changed. Get the child over to me at once. She seats herself on the settee. Sir George crosses to the fireplace and stands, eyeing Faye impatiently. After a little while, she perceives him, rises and joins him. St. Roche, coming forward. Nobody says anything about the new play you've seen tonight. I suppose I ought to try and sit it out myself. To the princess. But I, I hear it's a rather serious affair, princess. Princess absorbed. The play. Rousing herself. Oh, I found it interesting. It set me thinking. Thinking? Oh, Lord, I thought so. To Demolier. What was the acting like? Ah, I am very fond of everything English, of course. Except your acting. The English cannot act to save their life. I don't agree with you. No? Now, Miss Suliani. With an execrable accent. Voulez me donner votre opinion? Voilà l'opinion de la belle franco italo american Ha ha ha. Faye, crossing to the princess, casting a glance over her shoulder at Sir George as she goes. Pardon me, Sir George. I do agree with Mr. de Mailly. With a faint suggestion of mimicry. Your English actors and actresses are so, so frigid, so demure. Throwing her head back and laughing heartily. Ha <laughs> ha my lord, whatever happens, they will stick their elbows to their sides and look. Seating herself beside the princess. Genteel, do you say? 
If they commit crime on the stage, still you are sure they are really extremely respectable. They murder with the tips of their fingers, as you might express it. Breaking off, seeing that Sir George is looking at her crossly. Ah, I think Sir George does not approve of young ladies criticizing so freely. Sir George, hastily facing the fire, discomforted. Hmm, ah, uh, on the contrary. Mrs. Sabiston, eating sandwiches. I thought the scene of the dinner party in the second act absolutely ridiculous. Demalier, turning to her. That pleased me very much. It was short. Short? Certainly. They couldn't have been more than five minutes over dinner. Is it real food that they eat upon the stage? Can anybody inform me? Mrs. Ware, in soft, measured tones. Oh, yes. Real food of a kind. I once heard so. Did you care for the play, Mrs. Ware? Not in the least. The story of the piece was most distasteful to me. With drooping eyelids. In my opinion, subjects of that character are quite unfit for the theatre. She rises and moves toward Fay and the princess as if to join them. Apparently, without observing Mrs. Ware's intention, the princess rises and, with her arm through Fay's, moves away with the girl, passing behind the settee and joining Mrs. Roche and Denstroud. Mrs. Ware complacently seats herself upon the settee. Demelier goes to her and talks, bending over her. Mrs. Saviston and Eve now join the further group. The servants have withdrawn. Sir George, who has been sitting, scowling upon the fender seat, jumps up. Ha! Huh. St. Roche, going to him. Eh? Looking into his face. Put out, dear fella, about anything? Forgive me, Ronnie, I am sure you will feel as indignant as I do. Oh, more indignant, of course, if that's possible for you are under your own roof indignant certainly george what at this is a charming lady mr de Maley has dared to present to mrs st roche lady mrs what's her name where why who the deuce You've forgotten her, one of the women we found in Sackville Street that night? Sackville Street? At that supper Grisbond was kind enough to inflict upon us. St. Roche, his eyes bolting. One of those? It ain't. Which one? The woman who poured the burgundy into the finger bowls. St. Roche, his hand to his brow. Good God, of course. What an ass I am. Dear fella, I'm exceedingly obliged to you. Oh, I say, this is too bad. Fay, near the entrance to the billiard room. Because I am fond of the table, you understand. I can steeplechase the white into the pool basket and bring the red out, and sometimes I can make a cannon over a at. Will you bring me a at? A at. Yes, I will show you with pleasure. A hat? He runs up the steps and disappears. Fay leads the way into the billiard room, followed by the princess, Mrs. Sabiston, and Denstroud. Mrs. Ware rises, passes behind the settee, and stands, leaning against the pilaster, looking into the billiard room. Demelier joins her. Mrs. St. Roche is also moving towards the billiard room, when St. Roche, going to her in great perturbation, calls her. Bella? Mrs. St. Roche, turning to him. What? St. Roche, motioning to her to follow him. I, 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 I say, Isabel. Not now, Ronnie. St. Roche to Mrs. St. Roche. Do, 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 do you know what we've got in the house? Mrs. St. Roche eyeing him coldly. 
what we have in the house? Yes, a uh, rummon. <gasps> I wish you could be a little less vulgar, Ronald. Explain yourself. I beg your pardon. This Mrs. Ware, Lamorant knows her. No, no. Recognizes her. One of the m most infamous women in London. Uh, a shocking bad lot, to put it plain. Surely you don't mean that. Don't I? Mrs. St. Roche, with sincerity. <gasps> oh, George, if this is the case, it is too horrible. I am sincerely sorry. Eve returns carrying two hats, a felt hat and an opera hat, and goes into the billiard room. Eve, as he descends the steps. Hat. Faye, in the billiard room. A hat, yes, on the table, la. She has told dear Faye the most pathetic story of the loss of her husband, a missionary preacher in Japan. De Malier comes to Mrs. St. Roche his cigarette case in his hand. No one is smoking. Have I permission? Mrs. St. Roche, with dignity, drawing her skirts away from him. Maxime. Mr. Demailly. She passes him and joins those who are round the billiard table. Demailly simply looking after her. I, I am afraid I have offended Mrs. St. Roche. Offended Mrs. St. Roche? Yes, and you've offended me, dear fella, and Sir George here. I can't have this, you know. You cannot have this? This sort of thing going on, under my own roof, as Sir George puts it. Demalier looking at Sir George. As Sir George puts it? St. Roche, spluttering. In the presence of, of my wife and my wife's dearest friends, m most refined women, and my friends, gentlemen with, with, uh, with honourable notions of, of conduct. At first I didn't recognise the lady, didn't recognise her. The lady? Mrs. Ware, are you speaking about? Certainly. But directly Sir George reminded me. Oh, it's atrocious, dear fella. Reminded you? Upon my soul, I can't imagine what the deuce you mean by it. It... Demalier, calmly, but with a frown upon his face. But wait a moment. There are murmurs and some slight sounds of applause from the billiard room. De Malier goes to Mrs. Ware and touches her upon the arm. Then, in response to a look from him, she follows him as he comes forward. St. Roche. To Sir George, who makes a movement. Ah, I must request Sir George Lamorant not to go away. St. Roche. I have been waiting for an opportunity of speaking a word or two privately to Mrs. St. Roche and to you also this evening. Naturally, I wish you and Mrs. St. Roche, to whom I am indebted for great kindness, to be among the first to know that it is my happiness to be engaged, to be married to Mrs. Ware. There is a moment's silence which is disturbed by another ripple of applause from the billiard room. St. Roche, helplessly to Mrs. Ware, Ah, uh, exceedingly fond of Maxime, my wife and myself. Ah, uh, of course, we hope you will both be, um... St. Roche, will you be good enough to take Mrs. Ware to her carriage? To Mrs. Ware. I will come to you in a minute. With an uneasy little cough, St. Roche offers his arm to Mrs. Ware. She accepts it. Then she turns to Sir George and, with a curious blink of the eyes, bows to him in a manner which is a blend of grace and impudence. Sir George bows in return. <laughs>
St. Roch escorts Mrs. Ware to the foot of the steps, makes way for her to ascend, and follows her out. Demalier remains standing, looking at Sir George, who, after another pause, advances. Mr. Demalier, I am extremely sorry, but— He breaks off with a polite gesture. Demalier, between his teeth— you have been making gossip, scandal, to Mr. St. Roche concerning the lady who has just left the room. As St. Roche was about to tell you, I recalled to his mind the circumstance of our having met Mrs. Ware on a certain occasion. And Mrs. St. Roche? When I interrupted by asking Mrs. St. Roche whether I might be permitted to smoke, you were taking Mrs. St. Roche into the confidence, eh? Sir George is silent. Eh? Sir George bows. Again there is a pause. Then de Maillet turns to the table and, seizing the tumbler of water which he finds there, flings the contents full at Sir George. For a moment the two men confront each other steadily, without movement. The sudden sound of the click of the billiard balls and of another murmur of applause relaxes the tension. Sir George, glancing toward the billiard room. Ah, I can't thrash you here. Sir George produces his handkerchief and coolly and methodically wipes the water from his face and shirt front, and then he buttons his coat across his breast. I shall seize, I assure you, an early opportunity of resuming this acquaintanceship taking it up at the precise point at which we now break off. Demalier, with a return to frigid politeness. The sooner, the better. There is a break-up of the group at the billiard table with the sound of animated talk. For the present, I leave you to continue your, your tittle-tattle to the ladies. He bows to Sir George, ascends the steps and departs. Sir George goes quickly to the further table, takes up a siphon of soda water and a tumbler, and returns with them to the nearer table on the left. The various persons leave the billiard room. The princess puts on her cloak, aided by Denstroud. Eve, carrying his crush hat under his arm, assists Mrs. Sabiston with her cloak. Mrs. St. Roche stands by them, talking to them. Faye comes to Sir George. Sir George, why did you not watch me at a table while I was... What have you done to yourself? Sir George, laughingly playing with the siphon. <laughs> Drenched myself with this thing. There it goes again. My lord, I am very sorry. Princess, coming to Faye. Good night, Miss Zuliard. Good night, Princess. Princess, holding Faye's hand, looking into her eyes. I am so glad to know you. Thank you. Princess, turning to Sir George. Good night. Tomorrow at eleven. Good night, Princess. The Princess goes to Mrs. St. Roche. They are joined by Denstroud. Faye fetches her cloak and her bouquet from the settee. Mrs. Sabiston and Eve come to Sir George. Mrs. Sabiston shaking hands with Sir George. Let us see you before you leave London. Of course. Good night. Perhaps you'll come and eat. Delighted. She turns up the stage and meets Faye. They talk. Eve to Sir George. Are you going to walk? Surprised at his appearance. Hello. Sir George, in an undertone. My dear Arthur, what do you think? I've got to horsewhip a man. You? Oh, the most ludicrous mess. Yes, come home with me. Eve nods, and with Mrs. Sabiston, joins the group at the foot of the steps. Fay, her cloak upon her arm, and carrying her bouquet, comes to Sir George. St. Roche appears at the top of the steps. One by one, 
the princess, Mrs. Sabiston, and Eve bid good night to Mrs. St. Roche and Denstroud, and depart, preceded by St. Roche. Fay softly to Sir George. Good night, Uncle George. Be in tomorrow afternoon at three. I shall want to see you. Ah, you are not going to say good-bye tomorrow? No, 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 not, not tomorrow. Only to scold me for something good. You are right. I don't like to hear you, or any young lady, boldly airing opinions before older people. I knew. I watched your face. But I was rolling along. I could not stop myself, you understand. And these tricks on the billiard table. Where did you pick those up? A man taught me in New York, in the hotel we boarded at. He took great pains with me. Ha! Huh. Fay, looking at him under her eyelashes. Not ladylike, you think? Oh. Hmm, not quite ladylike, eh? No, indeed. I am so angry with myself. I will not do these things any more. Ah, don't. Fay, sighing. Good night. There, there. Good night, you... you... you rascal. <laughs> Sleep well. Fay, with a nod and a smile. Always, always sleep well. She gives him a final nod and leaves him, shaking hands with Den Stroud. Good night. Holding up her bouquet. Thanks again. Kissing Mrs. St. Roche. Good night, Mrs. St. Roche. Good night, dear child. Faye runs lightly up the steps and disappears. Sir George, shaking hands with Mrs. St. Roche, who is now by the ottoman. I may come in tomorrow afternoon? Do. With a little deprecatory gesture. I hope you have had a pleasant evening. Charming, charming. Shaking hands with Denstroud. Good night. Good night. Sir George descends the steps and goes out. As if oblivious of Denstroud's presence, Mrs. St. Roche crosses to the settee and takes up her cloak. Denstroud, coming to her side. Good night, dear. Mrs. St. Roche, turning to him coldly. Good night. Come, come. Be amiable. Giving a hasty glance at the door, he lays his hand upon her shoulder, as if about to draw her to him. Mrs. St. Roche, pushing him from her angrily. No, no, certainly not. With an impatient toss of the head, he turns away and ascends the steps. Denstroud, on the steps, pausing and looking back. You cycle at Battersea tomorrow morning? <sighs> it's extremely unlikely. I shall be there at ten. Don't be later. He kisses his hand to her and departs. She stands quite still, thinking. A servant enters, crosses to the billiard room, and proceeds to cover up the billiard table. Mrs. St. Roche walks slowly to the ottoman and sits, looking into the fire. St. Roche reappears and comes down the steps. She does not turn her head. He goes to the table and mixes some spirits and water. St. Roche, as he mixes the drink, What do you think that silly infatuated fellow's going to do? Demai? St. Roche, glancing toward the billiard room. Shh! With a nod. Mmm. He comes to her, bringing her the tumbler in which he has mixed the drink. Mrs. St. Roche, taking the tumbler, her eyes never meeting his. Well, what is he going to do? Marry that the woman. <gasps> Great heavens! The fool! Yes, shocking, ain't it? Mrs. St. Roche put in the glass to her lips with a languid air. She has blinded him, I suppose, with some story or other. <gasps> or he would hardly have committed the outrage tonight of presenting her to me. St. Roche 
returning to the table and mixing a drink for himself. That's it. Blinded him. And yet it's almost incomprehensible how a fellow can be as blind as all that. Why, the very man in the street. The servant switches off the lights in the billiard room and comes out of the room. St. Roche, to the man. I'll switch the lights off here. The servant goes out. Well, you had better let him know that he mustn't attempt to come to this house again. Poor chap. We can't be associated, however remotely, with such a disgraceful connection. Of course, of course. Coming down, glass in hand. I could tell you things I've heard about this Mrs. Ware. Mrs. St. Roche, rising. Please don't. I want no details concerning a person of her world. She ascends the steps slowly, carrying her cloak and her tumbler without looking back. <sighs> Good night. St. Roch, with a wistful glance at her. Good night. She departs. He stands for a little while, contemplating space. Then he switches off the light. The room remains partially illumined by the fire glow. He turns to examine the fire. Apparently assured on that point, he walks, still carrying his tumbler, to the door which is in the center wall, where, uttering a little sigh as he opens the door, he disappears. End of the second act.